Uh, Don Shula, our guest uh, in studio here on Live 105.3. Well, let me ask you uh, a question then pertaining to that uh, magic number, 347, which, of course, is uh, the number of wins you had in the NFL, the all-time winningest head coach. And it seems like, you know, sometimes in sports, Don, there are records that I think will be hard to be broken, if nothing else, just because the circumstances surrounding breaking that kind of a record uh, have been altered or have gone away altogether. I cannot imagine... Any single franchise having the patience uh, and the commitment and the dedication to stay with a head coach uh, like the Dolphins did with you, like the Dallas Cowboys did with Tom Landry for so many years, in order to, to get to that number. Because, you know, uh, to get to 347 wins, you got to take some losses. you got to win early and often. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how you keep your job. But uh, for the 26 years that I coached, uh, we had to – Best winning percentage of any team in any professional sport. Mm-hmm. So I think that's why I was unable to uh, stay around as long as I did. And and then, uh, you know, 1995 uh, was my last year, and I yeah. think uh, I think we were nine and seven and got beat in the first round of the playoffs. And the people, you know, were, were, weren't very happy about that, and uh, yeah. there were grumblings, and uh, so that led to my moving out and my retirement, and uh, and then since then they have. <laughs> The Dolphins have struggled, and this past year was just, uh, I think they hit bottom, you know, with the 1-15 and record. Yeah. And uh, and so hopefully they'll get it built back up. You know, they got to get back and uh, and to start making the fans proud of being Dolphin fans again. Was that Ricky Williams thing? Was that one of the weirdest things you'd ever seen where a guy just goes and lives on a beach in a tent? Yeah, the guy, you know, when he's there, he's a heck of a football yeah. player and a heck of a guy. But when he's outside of football, his mind is such... Uh, you know, he just wants to be all over the world, you know, with elephants and giraffes and whatever it, it takes in yes. different parts of the country and uh, or the world, I should say, mm-hmm. because it, and he travels by himself. But he just mm-hmm. uh, he just uh, when he's when he's there playing football, he's he's very productive. But uh, you got to figure out what to do with him the, the rest of the time. You know, I, I have never understood. I mean, we we saw this uh, uh, personally uh, with. Uh, Tom Landry, you know, making the the trend or when the Dallas Cowboys made the transition to the ownership of Jerry Jones and Tom Landry was out and Jim, Jimmy Johnson was in. Uh, you know, sometimes people will say about uh, uh, coaches that have been in place for a long time. Well, you know, maybe the the games passed them by. I have never understood that criticism because I understand it about the physicality of an athlete because your your brain your uh, your body can break yeah. down on you, but your brain doesn't. And so I've never really understood how that criticism uh, even had any logic to it because it would seem like if anything else the experience if nothing else the experience is is probably going to make you better yeah and you know a a guy like tom was an institution i mean the the guy was such a great football coach and such a great human being and Mm -hmm. and uh you know the cowboy fans i know were very proud of him and then all of a sudden he's gone and uh, then they come up with the game has passed them by, but you know that doesn't happen because you keep you know up to date with what's happening in a game when you're coaching, and you keep hiring new and fresh you know young assistant coaches and people that uh, make sure that that doesn't happen. And uh, I think it's just uh, an excuse that people use to to make a change, and I think that's what happened with Tom. Yeah, there's a reason why historians know more than anybody else, you know. <laughs> they've, they've lived longer. Well, you know, I always thought that it had more to do, uh, Don, with the changing of the, the NFL, but also uh, professional sports in general. Because back in, in his era and in, in, in the, the early parts of your era, we had players who stayed with teams their entire careers. I think now we get people who cheer the laundry and not necessarily the athlete. And, you know, to the, to the athlete's dis credit i think sometimes uh not to generalize but i think a lot of times they think of themselves as players union members first and then uh players on a particular team second it seems like it, that was just sort of indicative of the entire culture of the sport changing i think that the big thing that's that's changed is the uh the player agent has come into mm-hmm. the picture mm-hmm. you know in my early years of playing and also coaching i would have a direct relationship with my player and I'd call him in, and we'd talk, and we'd get something settled. Now when you have that kind of relationship, the player walks out the door, the agent's waiting for him out there. What did he say? You can't do this. you you know, you got to worry about your longevity, and you know you might can't play with that hangnail because yeah. it might jeopardize your future. So you've, you've got to be able to try to deal with that, and that's different. 
And then the other thing that's different is the off season. It used to be you had to work in the off season to supplement your income as a player. Yeah. Now you know when the off season starts, you get a week or two off, and then you're back into the off season conditioning program, working five days a week, three hours a day. You know drills on the field. You're in the classroom. You're doing all the things to get ready for training camp. So that's changed the game. Those two things, I think, have changed the game more than anything else. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, in the, the early days, like you said, professional athletes in the off season. I've, I've heard Hank Aaron tell a story where he said the first couple of years of playing with the Milwaukee Braves, he was a shoe salesman. He was rookie <laughs> of the year and then fitting you for uh, shoes yeah. in the off season. I know my grandpa ran a chain of liquor stores growing up, and he used to bring me back uh, autographed pictures of Walt Garrison because Walt would stop by uh, getting him to carry skull chewing tobacco in the store. So he was repping. Uh, something else uh, besides football. You know, I uh, had, I had uh, Plaxico Burris on the show maybe a month or so ago, and I was asking him, of course, you know, he is modern day, the day and age of the big free agent negotiations and the super agents like you just uh, uh, brought up, Don. And I said to him, I said, you know, when you're getting paid tens of millions of dollars, how is that dollar amount even brought up in a meeting? And he told me, he said, nobody even dares breathe it. They write it on a piece of paper and they slide it back and <laughs> forth across the table. Contrast that to anything, you know, you, you've coached so many of the greats, uh, you know, from uh, from uh, Dan uh, Marino to, to, to Bob Greasy. Uh, what is there anything that even closely compares to like a, a tense free agent type of negotiation you ever had to deal with as a coach? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of you know going back uh, when I when I uh, first got the head coaching job in in Baltimore. Johnny Unitas was my quarterback. Yeah, and, yeah. And I had played with Unitas, and uh, I wasn't near the player that he was, and now I'm brought back as his coach. Yeah. So you know that was a pretty tough handling that situation. Yeah. And then, of course, in, in and you Bob, were very young at the time, too, right, 33, 33, right, when you got into coaching. Yeah. At that time, I was the youngest head coach uh, yeah. ever, and at age 33. I think now that, uh, Lane Kiffin out with the Raiders was 31 or something when uh -huh. Al Davis uh, gave him the head coaching opportunity. But uh, so that was tough, you know, handling, coming back and coaching people that you had played with, and you weren't near as good a player as yeah. they were. And then all of a sudden you're their coach, so you got to prove yourself every day in those meetings and on the practice field. And uh, that was a tough thing to do at an, at an early stage of my coaching career. That's how I imagine I'll be viewed if I ever teach at a broadcasting school. <laughs> People will wonder what I did to uh, get that job there. Um, now, what about uh, something uh, much more current? Uh, of course, um, the uh, New England Patriots were uh, making a run in uh, 2007 at the uh, Miami Dolphins' uh, perfect season uh, when you guys went 17-0 uh, and 0 in uh, 72. And, uh, of course, they got upset in the Super Bowl by the Giants. But, you know, they had that whole Spygate business. They were videotaping the opposing team signals and all that sort of thing. Uh, I, I thought that put you in an interesting position. It was sort of like, uh, to draw a loose analogy, it sort of reminded me of when Hank Aaron was having to put things in perspective with the Barry Bonds home run record. I mean, he couldn't deny that Barry Bonds had it, but Hank Aaron uh, wasn't afraid to let people know how it might have been different back in his day. What were your thoughts on that. I think in my case, uh, what was said had to be said, but it probably should have been said by somebody other than myself. Yeah. Because everybody thought it was self-serving when, when I brought it up. And what I said was that they were penalized. Uh, they were fined, I guess, uh, a lot of money, Belichick, and then mm -hmm. also the ownership. And uh, number draft one pick, right? draft yeah. pick was taken away from them. And they were fined for doing something that they shouldn't have been doing that gave them a competitive advantage. That's why they were fined. Yeah. So I mentioned the fact that any accomplishments while they were doing that should be noted with an asterisk or just noted somehow. Mm -hmm. And that took a life of its own <laughs> because yeah. uh, uh, people felt that I was self-serving when I brought it up. But I was simply stating what was going on out there. After that first game in, in which they were fired, uh, fined, they did everything according, you know, to the rules and played, you know, the same way that everybody else was competing. And they should be given credit for that, which, you know, that got them into the Super Bowl. And, uh, and uh, their accomplishments shouldn't be questioned, you know, when they're playing uh, under the same rules as everybody else.
NFL coaching legend Don Shula in studio with us on uh, Live 105.3. I saw today, Don, that uh, Brett Favre filed his uh, reinstatement papers with the NFL. Of course, there's big controversy going on up in in, uh, Green Bay. And basically, at this point, they'll either have to uh, let him play, trade him. I mean, it's going to force Green Bay's hand. What are your thoughts on a, a player at that particular stage of his career wanting to play a little bit longer? And is there anything that you've ever personally had to deal with where you've had to have that difficult conversation with a with a legend? Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, when you've played as long as, as Brett Favre has played and accomplished what he's accomplished, he should be allowed to change his mind. Mm-hmm. And I think in, in this case, uh, that's what he's doing. Uh, the Green Bay, on the other hand, has got Aaron Rodgers that they brought in to be his eventual replacement. And uh, it looked like, you know, he was going to be the guy. But now with Favre coming back, they they say that, the, you know, that they uh, welcome him back. And what I would do if I was in that situation is just say it's, it's going to be competitive.